The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily represent those of any organization, including One Generation Away. The freedom of a people to choose its leaders is the root of liberty. Keep alive this experiment in liberty. Liberty, in case you've forgotten, is the soul's right to breathe. Government should be very minimal in protecting liberty. Peace cannot be purchased at the cost of liberty. The sturdy ground of liberty. Liberty once lost, it's lost forever. Fight for their liberty liberty and for our security guarantees individual liberty this great republic born alone in liberty 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 just how much do you want liberty this is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner a production of libertynation.com cutting through the double talk taking on the topics going after what the politicians really mean and making it all clear for your freedom and your liberty Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Joe Biden makes it official. He is running for president. Is this the best the Democrats have to offer? Welcome back in to Liberty Nation Radio, a production of LibertyNation.com and heard from coast to coast on the Radio America Network. Joe Biden does officially what everyone had been figuring he'd do, launching a third bid for the presidency and doing so with a video centered on Charlottesville and President Trump as an unrepentant racist intent on advancing or turning a blind eye to white supremacy. We'll examine Biden's chances as he enters the race as the putative frontrunner in a field now approaching two dozen candidates. America is the world's most charitable nation, something we often take for granted, but with tax season now finally over, we'll drill down on just how charitable the country really is and how dependent the country is on charity in our Foundations of Democracy segment featuring Abby Moffat, head of one of the nation's largest charitable foundations. Plus, LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor Scott Cosenza joins us for Talking Liberty. Is Joe Biden really the best the Democrats have to offer for president? Seriously? Up to this point in the nascent Democratic presidential primary race, the 20 or so candidates for the highest office in the land have attempted, at least rhetorically, to claim that their campaigns are based on something more than simply undiluted hatred for Donald Trump. But apparently not Joe Biden. In a stunning announcement video based on the single theme of Trump as a full-on racist, replete with haunting images of scary white supremacists marching in Charlottesville, Biden has evidently decided that naked virtue signaling and stoking fear of the Nazi-like figure in the Oval Office will be enough to hold his position at the top of the Democratic field and deflect attention from his own record over 40 years as a permanent politician. Charlottesville is also home to a defining moment for this nation in the last few years. It was there on August of 2017 we saw Klansmen and white supremacists and neo-Nazis come out in the open. Their crazed faces, illuminated by torches, veins bulging, and bearing the fangs of racism. And that's when we heard the words of the President of the United States that stunned the world and shocked the conscience of this nation. He said there were, quote, some very fine people on both sides. And in that moment, I knew the threat to this nation was unlike any I had ever seen in my lifetime. I wrote at the time that we're in the battle for the soul of this nation. If we give Donald Trump eight years in the White House, he will forever and fundamentally alter the character of this nation. And so Sleepy Joe, as he was recently called by President Trump, begins his long-anticipated campaign with a video based on a flagrant distortion. Like everyone else on the left, Biden twisted the words of President Trump, quote, there were very fine people on both sides, unquote, in the infamous Charlottesville march. Never mind that Trump specified who he was describing and who he was not describing. 
We don't have time to play you everything Trump said about Charlottesville, but once more for the record, here are the critical parts of what the president actually said. You had a group on one side that was bad, and you had a group on the other side that was also very violent. And you take a look at some of the groups, and you see, and you know it if you were honest reporters, which in many cases you're not, but many of those people were there to protest the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. So this week it's Robert E. Lee. I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. I wonder, is it George Washington next week, and is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? There was a group on this side, you can call them the left, you've just called them the left, that came violently attacking the other group. So you can say what you want, but that's the way it is. You also had people that were very fine people on both sides. And I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists. Of all the distortions the media has engaged in about Trump, Charlottesville may be the worst other than Russian collusion, of course. And now Joe Biden is basing his whole campaign on that distortion. Biden, of course, realizes that the black vote will be critical to his third shot at the presidency, so he pulled no punches in this naked attempt to depict himself, vice president under the nation's first black president, as the savior of a people he once famously said would be put back in chains by the Republican Party. Never mind that it's Trump who's produced the lowest black unemployment rate ever recorded. Of course, most people don't notice that because the elite media mentions it only in passing as they condemn the president day after day. Alternately known as Uncle Joe among mainstream Democrats and creepy Uncle Joe among many who've witnessed his unwanted advances towards women throughout the years, Biden has already engaged in a multi-pronged apology tour in advance of his official announcement. Now, hardly a paragon of political courage, Biden recently called Vice President Pence a decent guy. And then after one angry tweet from an LGBTQ activist, he apologized an hour later. He lamented, I wish I could have done something about the treatment of Anita Hill in the Clarence Thomas confirmation hearing in 1991 even though he was the chairman of the very Senate Judiciary Committee which conducted the hearing. And in his most shameless act of pandering, he recently decried a white guy culture that has got to change, somehow failing to grasp or papering over the fact that he is widely viewed as a poster child for that very corporatist culture. Or perhaps he actually believes his renunciation of a culture that has benefited him to an extraordinary degree over a life lived entirely within the political realm will result in forgiveness from the woke crowd he seeks to win over in the Congo line Democratic primary. But Biden's most famous and recent apology came after no less than six women admitted publicly that they were creeped out by his handsy behavior towards them over the years. You know, social norms have begun to change, they've shifted, and the boundaries of protecting personal space have been reset. And I get it. I get it. I hear what they're saying. I understand it. And I'll be much more mindful. That's my responsibility. My responsibility, and I'll meet it. Now, that statement was remarkable because he said, Social norms have changed, thus leaving the impression that he believes what he did was fine then, but not now in the Me Too era, so he'll change his ways. Biden is also hoping people will forget about his two previous disastrous runs for the Oval Office in 2008 after his famously amusing, clean and articulate description of Barack Obama He quit the race after garnering less than 1% of the vote in the first contest in Iowa. Hence, (laughs) the new nickname attached to him by President Trump, 1% Joe. Now, in 1988, 
Biden was forced to pull out of the Democratic primary after revelations about multiple instances of plagiarism. He mimicked entire portions of a speech by British politician Neil Kinnock and acknowledged plagiarizing a law review journal for a paper he wrote in law school. He also claimed to be the first one in his family to attend college, which was a lie, and that he finished in the top half of his law school class when, in fact, he finished near the bottom. Then there's the matter of Biden's son and his ties to the Ukraine. Hunter Biden joined Burisma Holdings, one of Ukraine's largest oil and natural gas companies in April of 2014. He was paid 166 grand a month despite zero background or expertise in Ukrainian affairs or energy. Then the company came under investigation for corruption and money laundering by Viktor Shokin, the nation's prosecutor general, who was promptly fired after threats from Biden's Obama administration to pull $1 billion in U.S. loan guarantees to Ukraine. You'll hear more about that, rest assured. The leftists in the Democratic Party will not forget Biden's support for the Iraq war. They won't forget his sponsoring of the 1994 crime bill, which resulted in a marked increase in black incarceration. And then there's Biden's statement in 1973 that gay people working for the federal government would be, quote, security risks. See what happens when you've been a part of the ruling class for more than four decades? A long record with much to attack, especially for this famously gaff-prone politician. So Biden was unable to resist his standing as putative frontrunner in this race, based largely, of course, on mere name recognition. But he's evidently convinced that this third shot at the White House will be the charm. What exactly does he think voters who so thoroughly rejected him twice before will find appealing in him this time? In a party given over to identity politics and radical change, he's an old white guy who represents the Obama status quo, which was rejected in 2016 so thoroughly that voters were willing to roll the dice on a bombastic political novice and serial disruptor in Donald Trump. There are so many problems with Joe Biden that he could spend the whole campaign attempting to explain them all away. Is this really the best Democrats can do to make Donald Trump a one-term president? We'll take a quick break and then get away from politics for a moment to discuss charitable giving in Americans. How significant is it and how important is it to the economy? We'll talk about it in just a moment. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Exhausted by all the fake news? On LibertyNation.com's YouTube channel, facts and fresh, bold analysis are what you get without the leftist spin. Subscribe today to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel because truth, 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 truth is making a comeback. that all men are entitled to blessings of liberty. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Well, it's time now for a segment we call Foundations of the Republic, where we examine how the for-profit sector intersects with the non-profit sector of the economy. Begging the question of whether the economy is dependent on charity or charity dependent on the economy, and to what extent charitable giving fuels the economy. Joining us to discuss this is Abby Moffitt, CEO of one of the nation's largest charitable foundations, the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, and she's also chair of Liberty Nation's parent organization, One Generation Away. Hello, Abby. Hello, Tim. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. Well, I appreciate having you. Simple question with maybe a complicated answer. Is the United States really such a generous country? Yes, very much so. Depending on which metrics you look at, we are in the top 
three most generous countries. And in 2017, we gave over $410 billion away. People believe that foundations are the ones that give more, but 70% of funds are donated by individuals. Talk about philanthropy as one of America's founding values, Abby. Our founding fathers were very much charitably interested in helping, and the founding settlers, particularly Ben Franklin. He was one of the uh, most generous, and he started the first uh, library that we have in British North America, and he started that in Pennsylvania. He got 12 artisans together to put the first library together. He also started the first volunteer fire department with 30 of his neighbors, and that was considered absolutely the first one in its history in this country. Now, there's a lot of talk about people of faith versus secular people in terms of giving. So here's a question. Are religious people more charitable than others? Yes. They find that uh, people that have faith give far more. Uh, in fact, it's um, research shows that less God equals less giving. People with a, re a religious affiliation give far more. Uh, and the research was done by the Lilly School at Indiana University found with Americans any religious affiliation made an average annual charitable donation of $1,590 versus $695 for those with no religious affiliation. Okay, that is a substantial difference. That's more than double the charity from people of faith as opposed to people with uh, little or no faith. Uh, what about President Trump's uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017? How has that changed how people give to charity? Well, as far as individual donors go, the tax reform doubled the standard deduction. So it's possible that some people will be less likely to itemize deductions, and tax advantages of giving can only be realized if deductions are itemized. But it's still out as because we haven't gotten the results for 2018, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, when the reform passed, Fidelity did a survey, and 30% of charities said that they expected to receive fewer and smaller donations. And so that's a concern, mm -hmm. because their charities are very much dependent on individuals as well as corporate and foundations. There's uh, a new book that's come out called Decolonizing Wealth, which demonizes, ironically, philanthropy. Could you say a few words about this book? Yes. Unfortunately, in his book, he says that philanthropy itself is a sleepwalking sector. This is a concern for, for foundations as well as all of us in charity because it doesn't let people take risks. Foundations particularly like to be able to take risks. And, for example, malaria, that could be changed as a result of one big grant that mm -hmm. could change the future of how malaria is treated. And so many other things that are dependent on the goodwill of the American people. Abby, this is really good stuff. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tim. Abby Moffitt, CEO of the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation. Quick break, and then we're back with our signature segment, Say What? Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Exhausted by all the fake news? On LibertyNation.com's YouTube channel, facts and fresh, bold analysis are what you get without the leftist spin. Subscribe today to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel because truth, 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 truth is making a comeback. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Say what? Say what? Say what? One more time. Say what? Say what? Say what? One more time. And now it is time for our signature segment, Say What? Featuring some of the most wacky, astonishing, and damnable things uttered by politicians and the chattering class. Impeachment fever is running high among the Democrats' voter base following the Mueller report, while the party leadership isn't exactly sure what to do. 
They want to take down President Trump by any means which avail themselves. But with a presidential election on the horizon, leading Democrats fear that a move for impeachment would be seen by voters as an overreach. Thus, the guarded language used on network TV by the three Democrat committee heads who have promised to launch investigations. Here are Jerry Nadler, Elijah Cummings, and Adam Schiff, chairman of the House Judiciary Oversight and Intelligence Committees, on their plans regarding impeachment. We may get to that, we may not. As I said before, it is our job to go, to go through all the evidence. Do you a lot of think other this is impeachable? Yeah, I do. Some of this, uh, if proven, some of this would be impeachable, yes. I'm not there yet, but um, I, I, I can foresee that possibly coming. Um, but again, um, the fact is, is that I think we have to do, be very careful here. Impeachment is likely to be unsuccessful. Uh, now, it may be that we undertake an impeachment nonetheless. Uh, I think what we are going to have to decide as a caucus is what is the best thing for the country? Right. What's best for the country, which has just been put through the ringer of a 22 month investigation based on hysterical and entirely false charges that Trump committed treason. But with the roadmap for obstruction laid out by Mueller, the Democrats continue to pound away at the president, maybe because they've decided they can't beat him on the issues, can't beat him on the roaring economy or on the record low unemployment across the board, or on soaring business and consumer confidence. So they'll just keep investigating every dark corner of Trump's life, hoping something, anything they come up with might weaken Trump in his attempt for a second term. The fact that the issues will favor the president became that much more obvious this week with a stark announcement by Joe Biden entirely based on Trump being a racist, which we played for you earlier, but also more radical ideas floated by some of the other leading candidates for president right now. Start with Focahontas, Elizabeth Warren, who would have the taxpayers pay off student debt for anyone owing up to 50 grand and promising free, i.e. taxpayer-funded, college for everyone. An idea that Stuart Varney of Fox Business Channel says amounts to legalized theft. We are going to roll back student loan debt. And part two is to make college universally available with free tuition. Can we talk about how to pay for it? An ultra-millionaire's tax. It's two cents on every dollar of the great fortunes above $50 million. We say you got to pay something back so everybody else gets a chance. This is buying votes with other people's money. She proposes to pay for all of this, all of this free college stuff, pay for it by a tax on the wealthy. That's a new tax. It's not an income tax. It's a wealth tax. tax. If you're very successful, you've made your pile, or they're going to take it off you every year. Okay, soak the rich to pay for free college and wiping out all student debt. But Bernie Sanders may have topped that idea, saying that prisoners serving time should be allowed to vote from prison, leading a questioner at one of those CNN town halls to ask Bernie this follow-up question. You have said that you believe that people with felony records should be allowed to vote while in prison. Does this mean that you would support enfranchising people like the Boston Marathon bomber? I think the right to vote is inherent to our democracy. Yes, even for terrible people. (laughs) What will they think of next? Most all of the Democratic presidential candidates have already gotten behind the Green New Deal, which would definitely bankrupt the country, Medicare for All, which would probably bankrupt the country, and the termination of all private health insurance, abolition of the Electoral College, letting 16-year-olds vote, and, of course, new gun control measures, as outlined stridently by another of the 20 Democratic presidential candidates, Kamala Harris. There are people in Washington, D.C., supposed leaders, who have failed to have the courage to reject a false choice, which suggests you're either in favor of the Second Amendment 
or you want to take everyone's guns away. Supposed leaders in Washington, D.C., who have failed to have the courage to recognize, you know what, you want to go hunting, that's fine. But we need reasonable gun safety laws in this country, starting with universal background checks and a renewal of the assault weapon ban. At the same time, on most every other issue, Kamala is hedging her bets, preferring not to take a position, but to have conversations. Do you believe that Americans should have the right to vote at age 16? I'm really interested in having that conversation. Senator, yes or no, do you support financial reparations? I, I support that we study that. We should study it and see. Elizabeth Warren is here, as you know. She's, is, she said that she supports um, student loan forgiveness for 42 million Americans. Yeah. Do, would you go that far? Do you support that? Well, I support anything that is about reducing the debt of student loans, and I think that's an important conversation to have. But, but people who are in... Convicted in prison, like the Boston Marathon bomber, on death row, people who are convicted of sexual assault, they should be able to vote? I think we should have that conversation. A lot of conversations going on among Kamala and the other, what, 19 candidates? The field growing by two more this week with the announcement by Biden and also by an obscure congressman from Massachusetts, Seth Moulton, known mostly for a failed attempt to get rid of Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House, but now looking to win the presidency. I'm running because we have to beat Donald Trump. And I want us to beat Donald Trump because I love this country. Okay, that's a winning message. Let's see if Seth Moulton can even get anyone to pay attention. A problem already experienced by... Another of the gaggle of candidates, Amy Klobuchar, senator from Minnesota, who delivered a line at another one of those CNN town halls about getting the best of a right-wing Republican. She thought it would excite people a lot more than it did. Every single time I have run, I have won every single congressional district in my state, including Michelle Bachman's, okay? That's when you guys are supposed to cheer, okay? (laughs) All right, so... That reminds me of when Jeb Bush had to induce an audience to applause during his failed 2016 presidential campaign. But it's not just Democrats who were lining up to try and take down President Trump. Last week, Bill Weld, the man who defended the honor of Hillary Clinton in 2016, said he will challenge Trump in a Republican primary And this week, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan visited New Hampshire and dropped not-so-subtle hints that he plans to challenge Trump as well because, well, the Mueller report showed that Trump did some bad things. There was some really unsavory uh, stuff in the report that did not make me proud of, uh, of the president. You should be able to have confidence in the character and the competence of the people you elect to office. If you can't appeal to anyone beyond the hardcore uh, far-right Republican base, you're yeah. not, not going to win. So, <laughs> so if, if, you, if you're going to nominate someone who can't win a general election, that's not good for the Republican Party. Uh, does Hogan even know that Trump was actually electable in 2016 because uh, he got elected? We close with a loser of the 2016 election. Hillary Clinton committed all manner of potential and real criminal offenses in her email scandal, but was let off the hook by James Comey, leading to criticism that if it was anybody other than Hillary, she would have been indicted, which makes this statement by Hillary after the Mueller report so perfectly ironic. I think there's enough there that any other person who had um, engaged in those acts uh, would certainly uh, have been indicted. Well, you should know because you certainly would have been indicted for destroying some 30,000 emails subpoenaed by Congress and sharing classified information, among other things, if you were not Hillary Clinton. We'll take a quick break and then come back with Talkin' Liberty. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. And now we welcome you into the section of Liberty Nation Radio, which we entitle Talkin' Liberty, as we're joined by our regular contributor, 
our resident constitutional lawyer and LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor, Scott Cosenza. Welcome back, Scott. Thank you, Tim. Okay, a big story on LibertyNation.com this week. We had an exclusive on it was this guy Larry Hopkins at what some are calling a militia group, but a group, a citizens group near the border in New Mexico who have been attempting to assist Customs and Border Patrol in detaining illegal immigrants coming over the border. He was arrested, sent to jail, beaten, went to the hospital. Pick it up from there, Scott. Well, the question is, why was he really arrested? So he is a a colorful character, to say the least, Tim. He is a felon. Uh, which has nothing to do with these current border activities. But the, what that has to do with is why he was arrested. The FBI says they found him in possession of firearms in 2017. His lawyer says, why did you wait 17 months exactly. to arrest him on this charge? Right. Which he has a, uh, a at least a, uh, the color of a defense for, which is that he says that the place where he was, which had firearms in it, his trailer, was occupied by another individual, his wife, and that they were his wife's firearms. The reason why we think he may be arrested not for that, but for his border activities is because he and his group have patrolled this five-mile stretch of the border um, near where Texas and New Mexico meet at the Mexican border, and they've detained over 6,000 people, they claim. Uh, This is an embarrassment for, of course, the border people and, and the the very left-wing governor and attorney general of New Mexico have sort of gone apoplectic over this. But they haven't made the case that he's violated the law there. Some of his activities look fairly shady to me as a civil libertarian, uh, you know, assuming uh, garb, their uniforms, I think, appear to probably most Americans, much less most Central American refugees, as being that of some official military or police group, Tim. Uh, but the point of the piece, uh, and I think the point of most activists' concern is, If that's what he did wrong, then arrest him for that and let him make a defense. Mm -hmm. Don't come at him sideways with this uh, this other charge. How legitimate is the argument that if Congress won't take the border crisis seriously, then citizens are going to take it into their own hands to assist the Border Patrol? That's one question. And the other one, uh, Scott, is the question of whether this is an armed group or not, because I've heard it both ways. Well, I don't think that uh, uh, Mr. Hopkins was armed when he was taken into custody. The, those firearm charges are about what happened over a year ago. But most of the people I see on their videos that I, I looked at, these are videos that that group published themselves on ver- Facebook and other social media pages, do show them uh, not just armed, but uh, armed in a ready position when they encounter one of these people, which is not the craziest thing in the world in terms of you're going to encounter because there are coyotes and there's multiple drug gangs that control the borders in that area. But at the same time, it adds to the idea that they are uh, engaging in some sort of a vigilante-like uh, activity. And to your earlier question, mm-hmm. I would just say to you, Tim, that uh, federal and state police officers and law enforcement enjoy qualified immunity and deep pockets of the government to protect them from litigation. And anybody out there who thinks that uh, they're just going to go ahead – and try to enforce the law on their own would do well to uh, have a very serious uh, read up on the various laws uh, around this so that they don't get uh, themselves in trouble either criminally or civilly, because I'm sure there's some Soros funded lawyer for one of these uh, mm-hmm. one of these people who's ready Certainly. to sue uh, the whole group. This is something that has incited the anger of thousands of citizens in New Mexico. A left-wing governor who refuses to even acknowledge that there's any crisis at the border, even though we have over 4,000 people trying to cross illegally every day. And the added problem that they want to be caught. They want to be put into the system. Uh, Let's take it down to a real micro level, something that everybody, almost everybody who's lived in a town or a small city or big city can relate to parking tickets and there was good news good news for people who don't like parking tickets from the sixth circuit u.s court of appeals this is why i went to law school tim this kind of a case okay i remember i do actually remember the first day i was i actually saw uh the marking of tires by uh, a philadelphia as a matter of fact 
parking authority, uh, the only the only city service in that city that That's operates efficient. with a ruthless efficiency, as you might imagine. And in Washington, D.C. Yes, as yes. well. Oh, yes. so many big cities. Yes. Chicago, I think, too. Uh, and I saw them put the chalk on the tire. And I thought, how can they mark up somebody's car like that? That's outrageous. Um, and, and, I, you know, of course they can because who's going to take the time, the money, the whatever to challenge it? Well, we have our answer, Tim. And the answer is Allison Patricia Taylor. She is our hero. She's from Saginaw, Michigan. And she got a number of parking tickets from the city of Saginaw. And she decided that uh, it was not okay for them to mark up the tires of her various cars. So she took them to court, and sure enough, she won. The Sixth Circuit Court of... And by the way, it wasn't just the district court level and federal court that she took this to, but the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the Sixth Circuit ruled on the case. And they said, you can't touch people's cars because they haven't done anything wrong. The city says, well, we're performing a caretaker function here that's allowed Uh to us under the Constitution. And the Sixth Circuit says, no, you're not allowed to molest or mark up people's property who haven't done anything wrong. Until, unless and until they violated some parking rule, they haven't violated any parking rule. They're parked legally. I love when you bring stories like this, Scott. That's terrific. Let's head northward to the U.S. Supreme Court, which has taken up a major gay transgender job discrimination case or two. So this is a big deal, Tim. Uh, We're going to be talking about this a lot, I believe, and reading about it a lot. This is the Supreme Court has agreed in its uh, October term uh, to confront the Title IX issues that are kind of out there in the law, whether uh, we may see some kind of assertion as to what actually it means to be a man or a woman. Legally speaking, there's a transgender rights case in there um, and whether or not people can be protected from being fired for gay, lesbian, you know, LGBT, whatever status, okay, including trans. So this is going to be a big fight, and uh, and we'll see what happens. Jesse Smollett's lawyers have been sued out in Chicago. What is the nature of this particular lawsuit? Because these suits are flying every which way but loose regarding— Another Jesse Smollett lawsuit. Yeah. Who, who, who'd have thought— and, we have potential criminal charges pending from the hoax letter, by the way, which which also may come down the pike. So this is uh, Tina Glandian and Mark Garrigo, celebrity mm-hmm. famous. He was Michael Jackson's attorney, I think, yes, back in the day. I believe it was one so. of the first big cases. So they made all these statements uh, after Jussie's charges were uh, null prost, as they say, or dropped. And uh, they made them to Good Morning America, to the Today Show, and to a podcast that Mark Garagos co-hosts with Adam Carolla. And the, those podcasts basically talk about how the Osundairo brothers, and I don't have their first names in front of me. Uh, forget they look like they were ready for anything. <laughs> yeah. Anything. The Osun- those, those guys would do anything. They're, the, they're ready for anything. The Osundairo brothers, <laughs> uh, they, they went on and basically talked like those people committed a, a real hate crime attack, when in fact... They say, and the evidence uh, suggests, certainly supports it, and they have what they wrote did a was check. a hoax hate crime attack. So right. Smollett is, is, is going forward with the notion that these two men are uh, race crime. Some, you know, they're, even though they're black, they committed this, this, this attack. And they're saying, well, we didn't commit an attack. We, all we did was actually agree to do what your client paid us to do, which was engage in this hoax. And they've sued the attorneys because they say they know it's true. And they went ahead with and said it anyway. And now it's one thing, Tim, if they said it in court, they could be protected from that uh, assertion. But because they said it to Good Morning America and to the Today Show and to the podcast, uh-uh. If false and they knew it, that's defamation. And that's the lawsuit that, uh, that they sued on. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. This program, Liberty Nation Radio Plus, LibertyNation.com's own podcasts, The Uprising, hosted by Scott, with occasional contributions from me, and The Rabbit Hole, Politics and Prose, hosted by Mark Angelides. All of them available online, on demand at LibertyNation.com, and from fine podcast providers everywhere. So that is it for this week, but we'll be back at you next week talking liberty. Till then, this is Tim Donner saying stand up for liberty, and we'll see you next time on Liberty Nation Radio.